Hey now everybody, Jamie here, and I recorded a podcast the other day with my good friend Bender, one of our episodes of the Dungeon Masters Ludus, and we were talking about role-playing games and being the GM and creating a world for people that comes alive, that makes it feel like the players are in a living and breathing world that evolves with those players. And it's been sticking in my mind ever since that role-playing games are, are easy to achieve this kind of thing with a little bit of elbow grease from the GM. But what about other games, like board games? How can we make board games feel like they're alive? Now let me start off by explaining what I mean by I would like the board game to feel alive. Uh, first off, of course, a board game sits on the table and it doesn't do anything on its own. You have to play the game to make it happen. Essentially, what I'm trying to say is that I, when, when I'm in the game, I want to feel like the game itself has a mind of its own and it is operating like its own organism. Uh, things may happen that the players need to react to, or the players do things to evolve that world, and there are consequences to the actions of the players, either positive or negative. Most board games feel inert when you're playing them, and you have to wind the engine and make it go, and you're basically the driving force. You're the gas in, in the engine of the board game making it happen. Now, let me talk about a specific designer first off here. Ignacy Jevicek from Portal Games. Fantastic designer. But I think one of his games was the reason that I always sort of started thinking about this concept of board games being alive. Uh, his company has a motto, and you can see it on t-shirts, and his blog has named it, and his, his book was named it, Board Games That Tell Stories. Now, this is the thing that makes me extremely happy with Portal Games and Ignacy himself, is that I can tell through that motto that he's trying to create experience first for players. And I appreciate that because experience is one of the most important things to me about any game. No matter what it is, experience is first. And now, even though Board Games That Tell Stories isn't exactly what I'm talking about here, it shows me that he's in the right mindset of something that I would like to play. So let's talk about Robinson Crusoe. There's a mechanic in that game that I feel makes that game feel alive to me. It's very simple. Basically, you go out and you, you search the jungle and you're trying to get food or whatever. You draw a card and on that card it says, you know, you can do some various things, but you get bitten by a spider. Nothing happens. But you gotta take that card and then jam it into the deck, shuffle it in there. And later on down the line, you'll draw that card and now that spider bite is infected. And you have to deal with the circumstances around that injury that you accrued because you went out in the jungle and tried to get food earlier in the game. Things come back around. And often games will have choices. You know, you choose A, that's the easy path, or B, the hard path. And the hard path might have, um, you know, reap better benefits, but you might fail and you'll break your leg. And later in the game, you have to deal with the infection of that broken leg or whatever. And that, to me, is just a very small mechanic in the game that makes it feel like the game is there and the game is operating and it is alive. Uh, let me talk about another game designer that I think is probably one of my favorites that exists right now, and it's Ryan Lockett from Red Raven Games. I believe that Ryan Lockett looks upon his games differently than a lot of board game designers. I've called him in the past a renaissance man. He's a true artist of board game design today. I mean, he designs the games, then he does the artwork for the games and the graphic design for the games, and he owns the company that publishes them. He runs the Kickstarters. He does everything from beginning to end, and he does them all pretty much flawlessly. And all of his games are just littered with experiential things that make those games feel like there's more to them than what you're seeing or what you're able to see. And it makes me feel like they have a world that's living and breathing. Let me, let me go in an example of his newest game that just came out was Empires of the Void 2. Now, event cards are kind of part of this whole thing of trying to make the game feel like it's alive, like there's something happening in the world 
generally. Most games, when you get an event card, it says uh, an earthquake happens and your dojo gets destroyed. Remove the dojo token and the earthquake card goes into the discard pile, out of sight, out of mind. There's nothing thematic to that. Really all it is, is the game poking you with a stick and saying that you don't have a dojo anymore. There's nothing really thematic to that. But in Empires of the Void 2, the event cards that go out onto the board, each planet has a specific event card that's shuffled in. There's a bunch of them in the game, so they're always different. These event cards don't poke you with a stick directly. But what they do is they create some sort of uh, event that is going on in the universe based on that planet. So the culture of that planet, the, the activities of that planet, the activities of villains around those planets or good guys on those planets is starting to happen throughout this world and you can interact with them. And most often, they're not directly negative towards you. You have to be involved with them by going to the planet and interacting with the card for it to even matter. But sometimes they do. Sometimes they change the game state slightly. But what this does is it really brings forward the theme of the game and the experience of the game. It makes every game feel just a little bit different and it feels like there's a progression to the setting of Empires of the Void 2. It is the exact right way to make event cards actually affect the experience positively of a game and I think that that makes Empires of the Void 2's whole galaxy of planets feel alive. And Going further with Ryan Lockett and some of his previous games, of course, there's Above and Below and there's Near and Far. And one of the things that I think was a genius addition to this game was all of the different character tiles and the fact that all of those different character tiles are different. They, and that's just an artwork concept. They could all be the same guy. Many games would have just made them all the same guy and then they're completely faceless people at that point. But the fact that he made them all different really makes the experience come up for me. And there's, it, it, it encouraged my brain to put story into the game. Now, granted, that's all on the player at that point. There's no story about the, you know, the red-haired guy with the handlebar mustache. I have to put that in myself. But the thing is with his game design is he enriches the game and makes you feel like you want to do that. It not only encourages you to do it, but it facilitates it so well. Because there was a time, the very first time I played Above and Below, just happenstance, all of my characters were female except for one. And he was this big, gigantic wrestler looking dude with a bald head. And he was the worker. He had one of the hammers. And all of the women were the ones that went out exploring and, and gathering like cool resources and bringing them back to town. And that created this awesome story in my mind. And as a matter of fact, to my detriment, it made me play up that story just because I was having such a fun time experiencing this living world that he was creating for me. It was silly of me, obviously. And sometimes I might have picked a bad choice of character because I was picking based on my story as opposed to gameplay. But what that means is that he facilitated such a great experience for me. And, I, and it goes on every time I play Above and Below or Near and Far now where I select characters that make sense. In Near and Far, you start the game with a cat. And the cat has very minor abilities. It's just your starting character. And it always pains me when I get my last guy and I have to replace my cat with that guy. Because I want my cat to go along with me for no apparent reason. I just want him because it's my cat. I don't want to leave him home. He's been on so many adventures with me now. I want my cat to go along with me. It's the little details like that that make his games feel like there's this world that exists. You know that there's more in Ryan Lockett's brain than is in those games. He created this lush world for us. And there's, uh, this happens too with Stonemaier games. Jamie Stegmeier designs Charterstone and the characters in the game you name them and it makes you feel good that you named these characters as Wiz Wandering Wizard came along and I called him Jack McGillicuddy and and Chris the next game he buys Jack McGillicuddy he's over in his tribe now and it kind of bums me out because man I was friends with Jack McGillicuddy first and now he's over with your tribe kind of bums me out a little bit it makes me think differently about the games and actually put some emotion into those games the games feel alive. And now those two examples are very different. The Robinson Crusoe version and then the Ryan Lockett versions. The Ryan Lockett's more heavily on the theme side of things. But Robinson Crusoe's 
very much on the mechanic side of things. F mechanics that facilitate the game feeling alive. And I appreciate that. And the game Fallout from Fantasy Flight does the exact same mechanic. Where you could, uh, there's a giant nuclear bomb there in the town and you have to go in and try to disarm it. You have a bunch of choices. You fail to disarm it, it blows up. Now there's no marketplace there. That is the players having, having consequences for their actions and their failures. Consequences in the positive and consequences in the negative that don't just happen and then go away and get discarded. Now there's this, there's this board state change for the rest of the game. There's no market there because you didn't stop it from blowing up. That's amazing. And that makes the game a pleasure to play. Now, there's a million different examples of the ways that designers could make their games feel alive. And many of them do. And that's not the only way to make a great game. Look at like a game like Arkwright. Arkwright doesn't feel alive. It feels like an engine that you have to wind and make it work. It's all on the player to do it. But that's a different kind of fun. I want more designers to try... To, to make their games feel alive by developing these unique mechanics to make you feel like you have an impact on the world, not just your own gameplay. Well, thanks very much everybody for joining me here today. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you love board games, card games, miniature games, role-playing games, you can always check out our audio podcasts at thesecretcabal.com or on iTunes. And while you're here, do me a quick fave and subscribe to the YouTube channel down below. And until next time, have a good one, everyone.